ask you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, I pray that our discussion and our study may be to your name's honor and glory, and that we may truly have a better understanding of your will for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in what I'm covering this morning, I am uh, not going to give a Bible study this morning. This first one will be an introduction. This will be a, an analysis of uh, two different Gospels. You have two Gospel trees in front of you, two descriptions of the Gospel. I'll be putting the very same things up here on the screen so you can see exactly where we are at each point. And uh, we will look at what these really mean, what, how to identify them, how to make an intelligent decision about them. And we will try to understand how best we can determine which is the true gospel. In fact, the real issue, the real question for today is very simple. What is unique, what is special about Seventh-day Adventism? What makes Adventism worth living for and, yes, even dying for? What is the key point of Adventism? And no, it is not the Sabbath. No, it is not the state of man in death. No, it is not even the second coming of Jesus Christ. The heart and soul of what makes Adventism unique, special, and different is its understanding, believe it or not, of how a person is saved by the life and death of Jesus Christ, how salvation works. Now, you say that doesn't sound quite right because that's what every Christian church talks about, how to be saved, how righteousness works. But I'm going to share with you why I believe this is what makes Adventism totally unique and special. All right, we're just going to go right up these trees. We're going to take a look at them and see what we can find. We're going to start with the tree that is on the left-hand side of your paper, and we're going to identify as we go. This gospel says that sin, and the problem with us is we are sinners. The question is why? How did we get that way? What is this sin problem that we have? And this gospel says sin is not what you say or do or think. Sin is what Adam did and said and thought as well as Eve. In other words, when Adam and Eve sinned, they not only turned this world upside down, they turned our natures inside out so that the nature that God gave us, which was loving and kind and generous and faithful and obedient, now became jealous and proud and arrogant and disobedient. And we fight against those natures every day of our lives. So these natures that we receive from Adam and Eve, this gospel says that is our sin. All you have to do to become a sinner in the sight of God is to get yourself born and draw your first breath. Sin is the nature that you inherited at your birth. Now, as we go through this little study this morning, I'm going to be sharing little uh, snippet statements from various individuals. And I want you to remember one thing as we go through these little statements. Every statement that I will read on both sides of these gospel trees is from a Seventh-day Adventist. It may be a teacher, a pastor, a layperson, but all of the statements are from Seventh-day Adventists that I'm going to share with you. Here's the first one. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. That's this statement right here. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. Now, what is the implication of that? Here's another statement. This sinful state means that if a baby dies a few hours after birth, he or she is subject to the second death, even though he or she has never broken any commandment. That is what sin as nature is teaching, that every baby born is born under condemnation. Every baby born. And, of course, the solution for that in many churches is infant baptism because of this very serious problem that we are born as sinners because Adam sinned. So that's the bottom line of this gospel, this understanding. And if this, that's true, then the next point is obviously true that Jesus Christ, when he comes down to this world, if he is to be my Savior, he cannot be a sinner. And so, therefore, if sin is the nature that I am born with, then without even opening the Bible at all to read one Bible text, it is absolutely essential that Christ not have our nature. 
So Christ has to have Adam's unfallen nature. There is no possibility of any other option. Christ must have an unfallen nature. So those are the first two points of this gospel. And because that is so crucial to this gospel, I want to make sure we understand it. So I'm going to go back down to that first point again, sin as nature, and look at it carefully. Here's a baby born into this world, born under condemnation, born lost. That baby growing up accepts Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. At that point, the fallen nature does not disappear. It comes under the control of the Holy Spirit. We call it the new birth. So that means that that fallen nature is just as much sin after the new birth as it was before the new birth. It is sinning still by nature. So after the new birth, the difference is that we are forgiven for that nature. So the nature is still sin, but we have forgiveness for it. And that's all well and good. But now we come to a point called the close of human probation. And at the close of human probation, there is no evidence in Scripture or in any inspiration that we are going to lose our fallen natures at that point. In fact, the only time we'll ever lose that fallen nature that we were born with is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So that means we are still sinning by nature after the close of probation. And that means we still need forgiveness after the close of probation, which means Jesus cannot step out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, which means there must be forgiveness for ongoing sin right up until the second coming of Christ. So that is what this teaching says. We sin from the moment of our birth to the moment of our death or until Jesus comes. And we need forgiveness for constant sin all the way to the second coming. Sin is as constant as breathing. All right, to the second point, Jesus Christ. You know, it really isn't about his nature. It's about how he was tempted. Adam and Eve in the garden. Could Satan make life miserable for Adam and Eve by harassing them around the garden day after day? The rules were very strict, weren't they? One tree. One tree, not only in the, in the garden, but in the whole world at which they could be tempted. Would you like that arrangement? One tree of temptation. You'd have to go out there to find temptation. Well... After Adam and Eve sinned, did the rules of engagement change? Where could Satan now tempt Adam and Eve? Anywhere, anytime. Out there somewhere? Do you have to go over there to find temptation? Or do you have to wake up in the morning, go to sleep at night, and he's there pulling at you through your nature? All right. So the rules today are, is Satan has access to you constantly through your own nature, through the nature that you have within you. And so the real question comes down to this. How was Christ tempted, like Adam or like us? That's the issue of the second point. And you know, this gospel says, not like us, like Adam. In fact, I've heard one explanation that says Christ was tempted three times in his experience. He was tempted in the wilderness. He was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was tempted at the cross of Calvary. And the unique thing about all those three is he went over there to find temptation. Not back in Nazareth, but he went out there. And there he was tempted in the wilderness, in the garden, at the cross. So Christ was tempted like Adam was tempted over there, outside of himself, not tempted to be angry, not tempted to impatience or pride or selfishness or overeating or all of the temptations that we have, but just on the great issues. Would he carry out his mission as the Messiah? Would he be obedient to his heavenly Father in dying for the sins of mankind? So the bottom line of the second point is Christ was not tempted in the same areas that we are tempted. He was not tempted from within. That would make him a sinner. He was tempted only from without, as Adam was tempted. So those are the first two points in this gospel. Now we come to where the rubber begins to hit the road. Justification, salvation. And you notice that it says justification only, not sanctification. Here's the reason for it. I'll share it from a statement. Justification is 100% Christ's work. 
Sanctification is a work done by us, aided by the indwelling Christ. Well, my friends, is a work done by us worth anything for salvation? Zero. Which means that if justification is 100% His work and sanctification is a work done by us, that sanctification cannot be part of the saving equation of the way we are saved. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? Let's say that you've been uh, a faithful Sabbath keeper for a year or so. But you've decided that in these hard economic times, you really can't feed your family, clothe your family, without opening your business on Sabbath. And so you decide reluctantly to go against the convictions of your heart and open your business on Sabbath and keep it open regularly. Does that in any way jeopardize your salvation? Now, that would be a sanctification issue, wouldn't it? The keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath on a regular basis. And sanctification, according to this gospel, is not part of the gospel. It's a result of the gospel. It happens after you're saved. You're saved, and then the sanctification process takes over, and it isn't crucial to salvation. So let me read you a little statement by somebody who has kind of thought about this subject a little bit. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God, is that correct? That is correct. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God, wrong behavior cannot keep a person out of heaven. Follow that little bit of logic? Since right behavior won't get you in, wrong behavior won't keep you out. One is not lost by not keeping the Sabbath or giving up the Sabbath. One is saved because one chooses to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus. The only way to lose that salvation is if a person chooses to reject that saving relationship. See, this is a very simple gospel. There is one way into salvation except Jesus Christ as your Savior. Once you have done that, there is only one way out of salvation, to lose your salvation, and that is to turn your back on Jesus Christ and say, I don't want you in my life anymore. I'm going my own way. And yes, you can lose your salvation experience with Jesus Christ by doing that. But anything in between that, you're still saved. Sabbath breaking, sanctification issue, you're still saved. As long as you are justified, as long as you are forgiven, you are still saved. Withholding of tithe, you're still saved. And we could go down the whole list, including adultery, and you're still saved. Because all sanctification issues are non-salvation issues. And the only way to lose your salvation is to reject justification as forgiveness and then you can lose your salvation. So that becomes the critical issue of this gospel. Justification alone is the issue in salvation. All right, as we begin to uh, travel up the tree, we come to the last point of this gospel. If all of that is true, if we are sinning by nature until Jesus comes, forget the talk of perfection. It is not going to happen in this life. It will wait until Jesus comes. Uh, perfection of character is something that is dangerous, something that we should not be focusing on, something that is not relevant to us today. All right, now this gospel that I've been describing is the orthodox mainstream gospel of the Christian churches today. It has been for centuries. This is mainstream orthodox Christianity. If you've ever watched those great scenes in the great uh, sports arenas where an evangelist of renown gives a call to, to, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, and hundreds, hundreds stream up to the front and kneel before the, thro before the altar. This is the gospel they're responding to. This is the gospel of Christianity. Now, this gospel has been impinging on the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the past 30 to 40 years, and so there are fruits that are being born within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The judgment that we believe began in 1844. Judgment? Why do we need a judgment? Judgment, that's opposite to the gospel. The gospel is love and forgiveness and mercy. Judgment is arbitrary and harsh and negative. If you've accepted Jesus, you're saved. And this judgment issue is very simple. 
uh, in this gospel, you don't need a judgment. All you need is a good recording angel secretary who writes in the record books of heaven, saved January 25, 1994, checks down the record book, still accepts Jesus, still saved. That's the only issue. Have you accepted Jesus, and do you still accept Jesus? What do you need a judgment for? Are you going to judge Sabbath-keeping? No. Are you going to judge tithe returning? No. Those are sanctification issues. And that's why, in many minds, the justification, uh, the, the judgment that began in 1844 is not only irrelevant, but negative to the gospel, contradicts the gospel, destroys the gospel, makes light of the cross of Calvary. And so there has been much opposition to this judgment beginning in 1844. Also, Ellen G. White and the Spirit of Prophecy, issues relating to that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm going to share a letter that came in from Seventh-day Adventists to Andrews University. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? An outstanding question. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? For starters, Deep Six, Messages to Young People and all other compilations, there is not a shred of gospel in the lot. Number two, stop publishing Steps to Christ, which is simply another works approach to salvation. Steps to Christ, you heard me right. That's not great controversy, is it? Sometimes we're a little fearful that that might be too strong for some people. But Steps to Christ, of all the writings that Ellen White ever wrote, isn't that the one you feel most easy, is the easiest to give to someone else? A simple statement of how we approach Jesus Christ as our Savior. How could that be such a negative factor in their minds? To understand that, I'm going to take you back to the year 1950, when a gentleman by the name of Barnhouse, who would later come in contact with Seventh-day Adventist leaders, the editor of Eternity magazine, a very popular Christian magazine at that time, received a copy of Steps to Christ from somewhere. And he decided to review it in his magazine. Let me share with you what, is, what he said. He said, the book is false in all its parts. It bears the mark of the counterfeit from the first page. It contains satanic error. And I'm going to remind you again, that was Steps to Christ he was reviewing. Do you begin to see what the problem really is? The book Steps to Christ, which describes the way of salvation and how we approach Christ, is diametrically opposite to the gospel that we have been reviewing. It talks about surrender, it talks about commitment, and it even gets into that dreaded word obedience, which is so negative in this gospel's understanding. And so here was a very influential Christian editor that saw the book Steps to Christ as very dangerous if you want to understand how salvation works. And apparently that's where this letter kind of comes from that attitude that steps to Christ is not a correct understanding of the way of salvation. Questions about Ellen White's writings. The law, the Ten Commandments, Seventh-day Adventists say that the law was not nailed to the cross, that, we, that it is for us today. But yet how does that work? If we're sinners by nature, we're sinning constantly, which means if I read my Bible right, sin is the transgression of what? the law. So it means we're breaking the law constantly. How can you have the law that you're breaking constantly as anything meaningful at all? So questions arise about the law. And there, of course, is the Sabbath right in the middle of the law. How can we make that central if every Sabbath keeper is a lawbreaker 100% of the time? And Sabbath keeping is still impossible if the law can't be kept. Up to the top of the tree. Health health issues. Well, that is obviously sanctification. That's not justification. So if, that, if sanctification is not part of the gospel, then how can health be that important? I'm going to read a couple of statements on this point. God's salvation is so extravagant, so comprehensive, that it can't be increased or diminished by what we eat, drink, or wear. Did you catch that again? Can't be increased or diminished by what we eat, drink, or wear. Exercise and a good diet contribute to a long and useful life, but they don't add to our salvation. 
Well, let's then not make such a big issue of it. Why is that? It may not be so important as we thought it was. After all, it's a sanctification, not a justification issue. It's not a salvation issue. And then standards. Now, I'm talking about all the standards of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, what we watch, what we listen to, what we read, our entertainment, and yes, even the clothes we wear. All of the standards of the Adventist Church. Obviously, once again, that's sanctification. That's not justification. And so that can't be as important as we thought it was. Another statement that I found. Members give assent to various standards and rules. As a condition of membership in the organization, we need to keep in mind that this assent is not related to their salvation, only to being a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now watch that, that little bit of logic right there. We ask people not to, we ask people if they want to become a Seventh-day Adventist to lay aside tobacco and alcohol. But that is not part of the Seventh-day Adventist way of life. Now why do we do that? According to this, it's because that's simply one of the rules of the Adventist church. Any group, any church has rules. And if you want to be a card-carrying member of that church or organization, you abide by those rules. But you understand that's not relevant to salvation. The smoking and drinking issue is a rule of the church, not a salvation issue at all, according to this bit of logic. Another person said it this way, Though I believe something to be correct from a religious perspective, it is not a matter of salvation. You may have been hearing that quite a bit in recent years. This isn't a matter of salvation. That isn't a matter of salvation because of this particular emphasis. Anything which is not part of justification is not a matter of salvation in this gospel. All right. So what we've looked at is the mainstream gospel of the Christian church and some of its impacts on Seventh-day Adventist doctrines and lifestyle. So here is where I'm going to share with you my convictions. I believe that this gospel, left to grow and flourish, left to become the mainstream gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist church, will destroy Seventh-day Adventism. We are in a life and death struggle here. This is not simply an interpretation of prophecy by which we can have differing opinions and come out okay in the end. This is whether or not we are in heaven with Jesus Christ for all eternity and whether Seventh-day Adventism has any future at all as God's remnant church. This is the heart and soul of religion. Did, did you notice at the bottom of the tree there's a long word called predestination? The reason for that is when this gospel was first being developed in the third and fourth centuries, everyone believed in predestination. God decides who's saved and lost. You don't have a voice in the matter. And for a thousand years, that was the belief of most Christians, that we are either destined for heaven or destined for hell with no choice in the matter. And what is very interesting is that although predestination has been dropped by most Christians, the gospel built on predestination is still the mainstream gospel. And if you look at it, it kind of fits. We're born sinners because of bad equipment. Jesus didn't sin because he had good equipment. We're forgiven for our bad equipment until Jesus comes. And then at Jesus coming, I guess Jesus is going to push a magic button in our brains and we won't sin anymore. In other words, bad equipment, sin, good equipment, no sin. End of discussion. Kind of fits with predestination. Now, I think we will all agree that the heart and soul of the way God saves is not predestination, but instead it is free choice. And based on free choice, a completely different gospel develops. Sin. What is sin? Sin in this gospel is not an accident of birth. Sin is not having bad equipment inside. Sin is not simply being a child of Adam and Eve. Sin in this gospel is simply this. When you know the difference between right and wrong, and you deliberately choose what is wrong, you become a sinner, a lost, condemned sinner in the eyes of God. When you know what is right, and deliberately choose to defy that, and do it your own way, and yes, we've all done that. But the key issue, how do we become that way? In this gospel, by making a choice, not just by being born. All right, based on that, Jesus Christ, when he comes down to this earth, he can take my bad equipment. 
and not be a sinner. So now we must investigate what the Bible teaches on this subject. And we'll talk about that as we go on in our study. But in this gospel, Jesus Christ can take my fallen nature because that is not sin. And he chose to not follow that fallen nature during his entire life. Therefore, he was sinless. So the equipment did not disqualify him. It would have been disloyalty that would have disqualified him as our Savior. And so in this gospel, Jesus Christ can take my nature. Now we come up to the crucial point again, justification. But you notice that in this gospel, justification and sanctification are included, not just one or the other. And right here is the crucial difference between these two Gospels. I want to try to refresh your memory again on the first Gospel, the Christian Gospel. Justification is 100% Christ's own perfect work done for us. Sanctification follows 50-50 as a cooperative work, I work and God works. So that's the key point of the first Gospel. Justification, 100% Christ's work. Sanctification, 50% Christ's work. Now, let's take a look at that very carefully because that is the key difference between these two understandings of salvation. Is justification 100% Christ's work? Yes, you're exactly right. It is. It is. There is no other way of salvation ever known to mankind except Jesus Christ. But are there some things you must believe and do to participate in this perfect work of Christ for us? Let's get very basic right now. Do you have to take this book as more than a collection of 66 interesting stories? You have to believe that it actually is the product of God's mind sharing His will with us directly as if He were here talking to us. Is that a big step of faith? I mean, there are a lot of books in this world. There are other holy books, the Koran, etc. And you're believing that this book is the only way that God has chosen to speak His will to mankind? Wow, that's a big step of faith. Tucked away about two-thirds of the way in this book is a story of one who came down from heaven, lived for th over 30 years on this earth without even sinning once, and then at the end of his life experience, he died as a criminal, and his death as a criminal is the way of salvation for anyone who accepts him as personal Savior. You have to believe that too? You talk about a bigger step of faith than even believing that this book is God's voice. Those are huge steps of faith that you have to make a decision about. Amen. Once you've done that, once you've accepted Jesus Christ and the story in the Bible, in the New Testament, then do you have to repent of a past way of life that has not been so good? Do you have to say, I'm sorry the way I've messed things up? If there is someone you have wronged, if there is someone you have uh, misled, hurt their reputation, do you have to go to that person and humbly say, I'm sorry from what I did to you? Confess our sins personally? Do you have to make a complete 100% surrender of your life to Jesus Christ? Well, those are all big steps, aren't they? Not easy steps. Let's say for a moment that you do all those things. You believe the Bible, you believe Jesus Christ, you, uh, you repent, you confess your sins, you surrender your life. And for just a moment, imagine with me that Jesus never really did die on the cross, that that didn't happen. How, far, how much is all of that going to get you? Zero. Is that right? So yes, Jesus Christ, the only way of salvation is 100% Jesus' death on the cross, isn't it? That is the key issue. And right here, most Christians do not understand what I'm going to share with you next. There is a difference between the cause of salvation and the conditions of salvation. Most Christians don't want to hear about conditions. Conditions of salvation. The cause of salvation is the grace of God and the life and death of Jesus Christ. That's the cause of salvation. There is no other cause. But there are conditions to participating in that 100% work of Jesus Christ. 
And we've just gone through a few of those. Big steps of faith. Big decisions about your life. Those are conditions. They don't earn you salvation. They don't get you salvation. You don't deserve salvation because you have done those things. But without those things, you can't be saved. And that Christians find a hard time getting their minds around. They, don't, they say, well, then that's works. No, it isn't work in the sense of human works because the only salvation is Jesus Christ. But the only way to participate in that is cooperation. That's the word. Cooperation with God's way. If this is the way, Lord, then I want to participate in it. Not to deserve anything, but because this is the way you have outlined. If I'm to be baptized, that doesn't earn me my salvation, but I want to participate in the way you have suggested that I come into a new birth experience. And so all of these conditions of salvation are the key issues right here. Let's... Um, Take it another step. Sanctification. Remember, the first gospel says that's 50% Christ's work and 50% my work. Let's take Sabbath keeping as an example. Let's say you're very careful about your Sabbath keeping, that you precisely end your business activities before sundown on Friday evening. You do not carry business into the Sabbath. You have a good Friday evening experience with the Lord. On Sabbath morning, you are in church. Sabbath afternoon, you are doing work for the Lord. You close the Sabbath on Friday evening, on Sabbath evening. Does that make you a Sabbath keeper? And I'm going to say, no, it doesn't. It makes you a Saturday keeper. Who are the best Saturday keepers this world has ever known? The Pharisees. I mean, they were very careful. They had rules for everything. They were not going to break the Sabbath under any condition in any way. They were going to make sure that they had boundaries all the way around the Sabbath so the Sabbath holiness could not be touched. And you know what? Jesus had to spend an inordinate amount of his ministry trying to turn Saturday keepers into Sabbath keepers. So what's a Sabbath keeper? Some people in the Christian world, misidentify us. They get our name wrong. They call us seven-day Adventists. Have you heard that? You seven-day Adventists? They may be more right than we realize. Wow. If we aren't an Adventist, a Christian, on Tuesday, you can forget about the Sabbath as a holy day. If we aren't a Christian seven days out of the week, then there is no Sabbath keeping possible for us, only Saturday keeping. Because you see, the Sabbath is a holy day, isn't it? And how can an unholy person keep a holy day? That's impossible. And so only one who has been made holy by the process of sanctification can keep a holy day in any way. Who does the work of making someone holy? Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ? So the work of changing a person inwardly so that they reflect the image of Jesus Christ and are holy from the inside out is the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. 100%? Yeah, 100%. You don't contribute to that. Do you have to cooperate with that? Are there conditions to that? So you see, we have conditions and cause again. Conditions of Sabbath keeping are stopping your work on Friday evening. But that does not make you holy. The work of holiness is bigger than that and precedes that. And so I'm going to say that the Christian gospel has made a tragic mistake when it says that the work of sanctification is 50% my work. No, it isn't. It's 100%. Christ's work, God's work, the Holy Spirit's work, 100%. And we participate in it. I'm going to use another illustration right here to kind of uh, set this in perspective. Let's say in church you come to church one day and you listen to a marvelous testimony. 
the person in church is giving a testimony of how Jesus has forgiven his sins, how he's having a good walk with the Lord. He prays, he studies his Bible, he's, he's out witnessing, he's doing things that really bring him happiness and joy and peace, and he just spends 10 minutes praising God for the work that God has done in his life. And you stand back amazed. I want that experience. I want to know how he's, getting, how, how he's doing that. I want to get, get acquainted with him. So one day you follow him home from church. And you notice a strange thing when he gets out of his car at his house. He's yelling at the kids. They must have ticked him off on the way home somehow, and that's not very good. So he's yelling at them and their faults. All the way up the sidewalk, he yells at the kids. His wife steps in to kind of blunt the force of his anger, and she gets the brunt of his anger as well. He's yelling at her too. And by the time they get to the front door, he's even pushed his wife. What do you think? Is there something wrong with that marvelous justification experience? Sanctification doesn't seem quite up to par, does it? Let's turn it around. Let's say there's a person in church who is a very careful Sabbath keeper, very careful in tithes and offerings, very careful in high standards, health reform, all of the things that make a lifestyle of an Adventist. But when you talk to that person, there is no joy in his heart. There's no peace. There's no happiness. He kind of hangs his head. And he says, I've got to do all these things because if I don't do them, I'm going to end up in hell and I don't want to go there. So I'm going to grit my teeth and I'm going to keep the Sabbath. What do you think? Is there something wrong with that experience? Sanctification looks good on the outside, doesn't it? But where is the justification? Where is the joy of forgiveness? Where is the happiness that comes from a living relationship with Jesus Christ? So what I'm saying is that these two, justification and sanctification, must work precisely in harmony with each other. They must be in cooperation if there is going to be any genuine salvation. It's not justification up here and sanctification as coming along for the ride. Justification is not the engine and sanctification the caboose. These are part and parcel of one saving process, and God does both of them while we cooperate with Him and fulfill certain conditions. That's my understanding of how the gospel works. And that's what the difference, the primary difference between these two gospels. Justification in the first gospel is all that matters. In the second gospel, sanctification is as crucial as justification. Now, if God can justify us 100%, and if he can sanctify us 100%, then is it just remotely possible that God can perfect us 100%? And I said God can. That he can do the impossible. And so that last step in this gospel says perfection of character is possible before Jesus comes going to share with you a little illustration that I think you'll enjoy. God works like an infinitely skillful physician. He can save and heal anyone who trusts him. He is not at all satisfied when we come to his office just to be forgiven. He proposes to bring us to the place where we won't have to ask for forgiveness anymore. He offers to heal that place where people do their thinking. Then they won't violate those rules anymore because they don't even want to. And all the bad habits are gone. To some, that sounds ominously like perfection. Servants see, these, see this as a command. Friends see it as a promise. Friends don't want God to settle for anything less. Would you ask a physician not to heal you completely? Would you say, 75% healing will be quite sufficient, thank you? To servants who think of salvation as dealing with their legal problems, perfection is yet another requirement. To friends who think of salvation as healing the damage sin has done, perfection is an incredibly generous offer. Servants want to be completely forgiven. Friends want to be completely healed. About that matter of perfection, the heavenly physician might call after us as we walk away from his office. Don't worry about it. I've so designed my universe that it's a law people become like the person they worship and admire. If you really stay my trusting friends, perfection will come. I'm not saying you won't struggle anymore, but the struggle won't be the same. My friends, if there's any hope 
for this elusive dream of perfection that Seventh-day Adventists talk about and is so maligned throughout the Christian world. It's got to be something like that. Healing by the great physician. Total healing. Total restoration. Total change in our lives. Came across this little statement, which I thought really summarizes everything we're talking about. Now, the first gospel, the Christian gospel, can be summarized by one word, and the word is forgiveness. If you're forgiven, you're saved. That's the gospel. We can summarize this gospel with one word also, and the word is restoration. Restoration. This emphasis makes Seventh-day Adventist theology unique. Remember the question, what is special about Seventh-day Adventism? What makes Adventism different? It's restoration in the gospel, not just forgiveness, not just making sure that your forgiveness of sins is up to date and then you're okay, but complete and total healing, restoration. Marrying strange theology with Adventist theology can justifiably be described as patchwork theology. And oh, my friends, for 30 years and more in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have been patching together our gospel with the Christian gospel, and we have got the worst hodgepodge that I have ever seen in my lifetime. Patchwork theology doesn't work. All kinds of people want a third tree. I put two trees on your diagram. People want a third tree, which patches together these two gospels. It isn't possible, not logically not consistently and not biblically. So, my friends, I do believe there's a crucial issue at stake. Let's take a brief look at what happens in the fruits of this tree. The judgment. Is a judgment necessary in this gospel? If there are two people in church who look like they're doing the same thing, they are, they are to all outward appearances the same, but God can see into the heart of one that that one is, is, is making it up, is making a pretense of it, and the other one is a genuine. Doesn't that need some opening of books and examining of life and motive and activities so that everyone can see why one person would be happy and joyful in heaven and the other person would find it a living hell for the rest of eternity? Isn't a judgment necessary to answer questions that human beings and even angels can't understand? Because only God can read the motives of the heart and what has happened in their experience. So a judgment becomes crucially important, not as an opposition to the gospel, but as a demonstration of the gospel and how the gospel really is our salvation. Ellen G. White. I came across this statement from Dwight Nelson, as you may have seen some of his programs on net or whatever. If you've been in the Seventh-day Adventist church very long at all, you've been tempted to not believe in this prophet stuff. In today's religious environment, it's embarrassing to be different. It's embarrassing to have a prophet in your movement. You're considered a bit odd, a little strange. And so we have gone quiet about Ellen White. Without any fanfare or apology, we've simply gone silent. Don't quote her from the pulpit, we admonish each other. Just read the word. Didn't she give some counsel to that effect? But the time has come, this close to the end of earth civilization, to re-examine, reflect, re-study, and recommit ourselves to the mission and message of that woman, the most prolific female author in the history of the human race. It's time to stop apologizing for her ministry, both in our own movement and outside of it. And I say, well said. Well said. We don't need to apologize or to feel second-class citizens because God chose to give us help at the end of time. And then after all those good things, he really stepped on our toes hard. He said, we shouldn't call these the red books. They're really the unread books. You know, does it make a lot of difference if we hold a book-burning ceremony in our backyard and burn all these legalistic Ellen White books so we don't have to look at them anymore? Or if we have every one of her books that she has ever written on our library shelves in pristine condition because we never take them down? Doesn't make much difference, does it? So we've got to decide what we believe about this gift given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The law. 
the Ten Commandments. We say the law is not nailed to the cross. The law is for us today. The law can be kept by Christians, but watch it now. If I were to ask for a volunteer to let me follow you home with a video recorder, video everything you say and do of relevance for the next 30 days, and then bring you back up here and bring you before the people as a person who has kept the law perfectly for 30 whole days. Here's the proof. How many takers might I get today? Perhaps not many, because we remember just what happened yesterday and how we had to say, Lord, please forgive me again. So where's the evidence that the law can be kept by someone with a fallen nature? Where's the evidence? Ah, uh, you know, that's the only evidence we can, call, we can call upon. Not me, not you, not even the great heroes of the Bible, because everyone that has ever lived has been a sinner at some point in their life. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only one that is the proof, the living proof, that the law can be kept by someone with a fallen nature is Jesus Christ, and only if he took a fallen nature. If he didn't take a fallen nature, no one has shown that to this day. And Satan is still winning the argument, you can't keep the law in a fallen nature. That's how important the subject is. And the Sabbath, that's just the flag of the law. You hold up the flag of the Sabbath as a statement, I love God's law. That's what the Sabbath really is all about, a statement of loyalty. All right, up to the top of the tree, health. Uh, let's say you find a person on your street who isn't doing so well. Physically, you take pity on this person. You say, if you will allow me to tell you exactly what you're going to do with your life for the next month, I will bring you into my home and we'll get you fixed up. Will you do that? He says, I'm desperate. I'll do it. He comes into your home. You teach him all the laws of health reform, every one of them. He follows them faithfully. And you know what? The statistics are, even if a person has messed up their life, that following the laws of health faithfully will give them extra years of life on this earth. And he does. He has his extra years of life. And then he dies a natural death. And he wakes up in the wrong resurrection at the end of the millennium. Have we done him any good? We gave him extra years of life. He didn't get a heart attack. That's what health reform is all about, isn't it? Or not? Not at all. Health reform is very simple. The body and the mind are one unit. What affects one affects the other. And it goes both ways. If the body is all messed up, the blood supply is all messed up, and the blood supply feeds the brain where we do our thinking and our choosing and where God brings his salvation calls to us. So if a person is physically messed up, he is mentally messed up at the same time. So what is health reform about? To get the body in good shape, to get the blood supply in good shape, to get the brain functioning properly so that God has a fighting chance to save our souls. So that God can talk to us and we're not just in a fog in which we can't hear anything at all. Health reform does not save. But health reform makes it a lot easier for God to save us. Amen. Standards of the church. And I'm talking again about all of them. Let's say that uh, you listen to your pastor and do what your pastor says 75% of the time. And then you listen to your favorite TV personality and do what he or she says the other 25% of the time. Who's going to win that little tug of war? I'm afraid your pastor is on the losing side. Because we got this fall in nature, don't we? So what is going on here? Is Satan a good communicator? Does he know how to reach through to our minds even when we don't know he's reaching through to our minds? Does he know how to get behind our will and choice faculties to the emotions? He's a good communicator. Is God a good communicator through the Holy Spirit? So we've got two master communicators, both trying to convince us of the rightness of their ways every day of our life. They're trying to convince us that they're right. Standards, what are they for? If your standards are lifted up high, you know what you can actually do? You can shut Satan's voice out of your life in a whole bunch of ways. 
You can stop him from talking to you. You can move away from what he is trying to say to you by what you don't read, what you don't watch, what entertainment you don't participate in, so that Satan doesn't have that full access to your minds all the time. And if you've blocked Satan out of your mind, does that give God a little more opportunity to talk to you? Open up some channels of communication that weren't there before? Okay, so that means that high standards... Faithful standards give God a fighting chance to save your soul. Standards don't save you. But standards open a door for God that would be shut otherwise if your standards are low or missing because Satan has full access to your mind 100% of the time. Standards become vitally important, you see, in this gospel, not as a means of salvation, but as a participation, a cooperation in God's 100% work of justifying you and sanctifying you. All right, that's the gospel I understand to be the gospel of the Bible, the gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And here is a little statement that I think is relevant for us today. It is sad to see the illusion further popularized that such lifestyle issues as diet and adornment come from a religious perspective but are, quote, not a matter of salvation. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject, it must be salvation related or God would have left it alone. Wow, that's a good principle. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject, it must have something to do with salvation or God would not have wasted his time. It may not be the means of salvation, but it may be a condition of salvation or an, a way to achieve salvation or God would not have bothered talking about it. Well, my friends, that is what I understand to be the gospel of the Bible and what is unique about Seventh-day Adventism. And I'll go one step farther here. Satan's great objective, as best I can tell, is to destroy this gospel. He is content for you and me to be Sabbath keepers, believing that Jesus Christ is coming literally in the clouds of heaven. We won't fall for Satan impersonating Christ. We're not going to believe that there are ghosts around. We're not going to be tricked by Mary appearances around the world. We're not going to be involved in all of these deceptions. But if we believe a false gospel, he's got us. And he doesn't care if we believe all the right things about the Sabbath and the second coming of Christ and the state of man after death. If we, if we believe his gospel, that it is allowable to go on sinning in some way until Jesus comes, then he's got us, no matter what truth we believe in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so I believe that this is Satan's last attack upon God's remnant people just before the second coming of Christ. Destroy their gospel, negate their gospel, compromise their gospel, make sure that my understanding of salvation takes preeminence in their lives. And he's got us. And this is the great, great danger of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today is a compromised gospel. Everything else, every problem that we have in the church today, no matter what controversies we have, flow out of that. That is the root cause, which is why I don't spend much time talking about symptoms of apostasy. And there are quite a few of them. But I want to talk about the root cause of apostasy. And that is living, believing, and being persuaded that a gospel is not quite what we thought it was. It's, a, it's an easier gospel. It's a gospel which is more comfortable to me, a gospel I can live in and still sin a fair amount, and I'm still okay. All right. That is my understanding of the gospel, and here is where we're going to uh, uh, kind of adjust a little bit. Up to this point, I have not said anything that should give you any evidence that what I'm saying is true, because all I have given you are my opinions. Have you noticed that? I haven't opened the Bible. I haven't given you any inspiration at all to support anything I've said. So I'm going to ask you to do, do something. Don't believe what I've said because I've said it. Because if you do, you'll believe someone else because they say it. Believe it only if you have studied it for yourself and know for yourself what is true. 
So we'll spend the rest of our time during this seminar opening up the Word of God to see if these things are so.